retro throwbacks have become increasingly common over the last decade, but I'd argue only an elite few truly nail the aesthetic and design sensibilities of that target era. It's the delicate use of color, the perfect placement of pixels, combined with a sharp eye for detail that can elevate such a game to the point where they almost feel period appropriate. Such authenticity is the calling card of Brazilian developer Joy Masher. Known for the superb Odalis, Oniken, and Blazing Chrome, Joy Masher's work offers a perfect blend of Japanese design sensibilities with a side of Brazilian style, and its latest work is no exception. This is Vengeful Guardian Moonrider, a game built on the foundation of classic 16-bit action games such as Shinobi and Mega Man X, while introducing fresh new scenarios, gorgeous pixel art, and a strong gameplay foundation. It's a great game, and as such, I wanted to showcase it here on Digital Foundry. In this video, then, we'll explore its inspirations and underlying mechanics, dive into how the game works under the hood thanks to some behind-the-scenes footage, and see how it runs. So, without further delay, let's dive in. In 1987, Sega unleashed a platform action game known as Shinobi. Building on concepts pioneered in Namco's Rolling Thunder, Shinobi asks players to fight their way across a range of stages in pursuit of the Zed terrorist organization. It was challenging, meticulous, and a colossal hit for Sega. It's 1989's The Revenge of Shinobi, however, that really caught my attention. Revenge of Shinobi is one of the earliest and impressively best games for the 16-bit Sega Mega Drive. The gameplay is tight, refined, and improved over the arcade original, while Yuzo Koshiro's evocative beats score the action. Four years later, the Shinobi series continued with Shinobi 3, this time from a different development team. It boasts faster gameplay, new moves, and exceptional level design, ensuring its place in the annals of history. It's one of the best 16-bit action games ever made. And that's not even touching on the also excellent Shadow Dancer games. All told, the Shinobi series helped solidify what I like to refer to as the precision action genre. Compared to faster paced run and guns or standard platform action games, precision action has a certain rhythm that places an emphasis on timing and careful execution. The Revenge of Shinobi embodies this perfectly, rush into a situation even early in the game and you'll quickly fail. Instead, the game asks players to approach each scenario with skill and precision. And it's from this concept that Vengeful Guardian Moonrider is born. As a modern precision action game, Moonrider tasks players with working their way through a series of challenges that demand careful yet rapid execution. Fans of Shinobi will recognize moves such as the Ninja Death Strike, which involves double tapping a direction to run, then timing your attack to deliver a powerful blow or the aerial death kick that allows you to deliver death from above. It's the interplay between basic strikes and momentum-driven attacks that help keep the action moving. Of course, that's not to say that Moonrider doesn't feature its own mechanics. After defeating each boss, the player earns stronger attacks powered by a secondary MP meter, which includes everything from a laser whip and an air dash to a powerful tentacle attack pulled through time and space. In addition, players can equip multiple power-up chips. These chips are secretly placed throughout each level, requiring some additional exploration, but upon discovery, you'll gain additional powers, including MP regeneration, or a chip that basically enables easy mode by reducing the damage Moonrider takes. Between the stage selection, the hidden chips, and the weapons earned from defeating bosses, though, you might have noticed a similarity to another classic series, that being Mega Man. In fact, according to lead designer Danilo Diaz, Mega Man X specifically served as further inspiration for Moonrider. After completing the introduction stage, you'll have a choice between different areas, each with their own end boss, much like Mega Man. The stages themselves also feature larger interconnected environments with more platforming that is closer to Mega Man X than the Shinobi series. Plus, the voice clips used before each boss encounter were directly inspired by childhood memories of playing Rockman X4 on a Sony PlayStation.
Of course, while the level design is indeed reminiscent of Mega Man, certain scenarios may feel familiar to Shinobi 3 fans as well. For instance, there's an elevator sequence which has players tackling enemies launching an assault from the left and right sides of the screen as you slowly ascend towards your goal. Furthermore, Shinobi 3's fast-paced interludes, including the high-speed horse riding sequence, are also conceptually replicated, this time via a 3D superscaler-esque sequence instead. When I say conceptually, I'm referring to the fact that it's essentially a different sort of gameplay that you engage with before reaching the actual main level. It works pretty well. Honestly, the point here is that Moon Rider feels like a proper homage to some of the best Japanese developed action games from the past, but with its own unique aesthetic to back it up. While working on this video then, I had a chance to discuss Moon Rider's creation with Danilo, and it turns out that this is a very personal project. In fact, it began development prior to the completion of Blazing Chrome, with the goal of creating a game inspired by Kamen Rider Black and other classic Japanese action games. To achieve this, Danilo began working with a game engine known as Construct 2. Unlike Game Maker 2, which powered Blazing Chrome though, Construct 2 is an HTML5 based engine with a simple development UI. Ultimately, when it was decided that Moon Rider would become the next big Joy Masher game, Danilo partnered with his friend Andre Silva, who took over the programming side of the project, with Yuri Neri handling the superscalar portions. So I wondered, what did the pipeline look like from plotting those original pixels all the way to implementing the actual gameplay? Well, it begins with a program known as A-Sprite. Anyone that's dabbled in pixel art will likely recognize this, and it's this tool that allowed Danilo to create the game's artwork. From characters to bosses and background tiles, everything is drawn from scratch using nothing but a mouse. It helps organize animation sequences and build out all the assets needed for the game. Larger foes are broken up into multiple sprite chunks which all work in tandem to create larger overall animations. The tile work created for the environments then can be imported into a separate program known as Tiled, which is used for level editing. Now Tiled has been used to create games such as Axiom Verge and Shovel Knight in the past, and it's been used for Moon Rider as well. Each stage is laid out using the tiles created in a sprite, and once complete, the file is exported into a format usable within Construct 2. It's here then that each level's collision data can be defined by the designer. You know, the blocks necessary to determine where a player can and cannot traverse. The collision blocks are placed to fit the design of the game's pixel art map so that floors and walls can be set as solid objects on which to traverse. To save on memory, however, Construct 2 also breaks down the map graphics into reusable tiles, which are visible here. The parallax scrolling then is handled using these different layers, and those layers can be set to scroll at a different rate compared to the foreground. It's all really intuitive stuff. But with this in mind, let's take a closer look at the game's opening stage to better understand how some aspects of the game functions. It begins here with this introduction cutscene. Moonrider is released from his chamber and promptly skewers the surrounding scientists. So how does a sequence like this work? Well, basically these red boxes are used to trigger an animation sequence. When Moonrider's sprite emerges from the container, it hits one of these boxes, which in turn triggers the correct animation sequence to play, an animation sequence he would have drawn in a sprite. Within Construct 2, then, each box is defined by values assigned here. You'll notice that each animation sequence has a timer associated with it, rather than a number of frames. So between these values, the game will play that specific sequence, while the next values will trigger a different sequence. It's simply a means of creating these basic cutscenes, but it works really well. Once that's complete, then you're handed control of Moon Rider and can begin playing the game. This is where the camera comes into play. As a side-scrolling game, the camera follows the player character around the map, but this also determines enemy behavior and spawning. So how does that work? Well, this colored frame here represents the camera around Moon Rider. You can see his life bar up here in the upper left corner as well. Scripted events, such as enemy spawns, are controlled by variables referencing these colored borders. For instance, if you click on this enemy here, there's a series of variables referring to the different sides of the frame. 
This one here refers to the right hand side of the camera, though it's written in Portuguese. If you set it to true, the game will spawn this enemy when the right side of the camera collides with this object. If you set the enemy to spawn on the left border, however, the enemy will instead spawn behind the player after walking past them. It's a simple setup, but it's effective, right? And every enemy you encounter has these variables, which controls how and when they appear within a scene. Now, if we continue, we encounter the first item box. This sprite can have three variables to find its context. HP, which refers to your life, lives, which is the number of lives you have, and MP, referring to the secondary power meter. Those are the three power-ups you'll encounter during gameplay. But if you look above that, you might also notice sword, spear, and boomerang variables. According to Danilo, this refers to the game's original design, which we can see here. Basically, in this initial version, Moonrider would pick up one of three items to use as his primary weapon, the spear, sword, or boomerang. And when you walk over a new weapon, your prior weapon will pop out much like a secondary item in a Castlevania game. Which raises another interesting point. Danilo noted that early on, Moonrider was designed to play more like Castlevania Rondo of Blood on the PC Engine. By that I mean each stage would offer two unique paths, with each resulting in a branching stage and a unique boss battle. Depending on the path you take, the level you'd then play next would also change. This is exactly how Rondo of Blood functions, but in this case, it was decided to move to a more Mega Man-like level selection screen to ensure that players could experience every level on their way to the end. Curiously, within the editor, we can still see remnants of the old Rondo of Blood style design. This vertical shaft, for instance, would have been one of those optional paths. Now, moving on, we have our first environmental hazard. Like other objects, this one has a variable which controls its impact. In this case, it's simply called Can Damage Player. Enable this, and upon touching the obstacle, you guessed it, Moonrider will lose health. Now if we continue, you may notice an enemy here placed on this ledge. It seems trivial, but this is another thing that requires definition within the editor. Here, they simply place these two X blocks on either side of the platform, which basically serves as a boundary for the enemy. This means they cannot walk off the platform. Now, if we continue on past that enemy, we'll reach this section and you'll notice the big star icon. This serves as a checkpoint, which is placed just before facing off against the first mid boss. And the mid boss room contains special scripting for the boss and soldier behavior, along with these cutscene triggers, which occur after a certain point. This door here can be destroyed by the cannon, which is the key strategy behind this particular fight. Once you finish this battle then, it's off to the next segment and the game continues. I think this should give you a rough idea of how Moonrider stages work in general. It's all about building the artwork, designing the stages, then importing everything into Construct 2 where the behavior of the game itself can be defined. There is one exception though, and that's the 3D stages. According to Danilo, the programmer for these sections was not a huge fan of Construct 2 and decided to write his own code specifically for these levels. When viewed in Construct 2 then, all you see is this black window. What's happening is that this separate program is basically called from within Construct 2 and run on top of it. So how are these stages designed from a gameplay perspective? Well, using good old text entry. Yes, everything is laid out using the values defined here, which the 3D portion of the program can read and plot out the level. According to Danilo, this part of the process was painful, requiring a lot of trial and error. Still, despite this, the overall workflow used to create Moonrider is streamlined and simple, allowing this very small team to build an authentic 90s experience. Construct 2 certainly has its fair share of issues, but it seems very capable in the right hands. So with this in mind, how do the various ports of this game run? Well, the PC release is the main version of the game. What's great about this one though, is that it seems to support frame rates above 60 frames per second. 2D platform games feel absolutely sublime when played at higher frame rates. So this is a key feature that greatly enhances the overall experience. Beyond that, it seems to work and run without issue. What's interesting here is that the HTML5 nature of Construct 2 means that it's basically running in its own web browser window. 
That doesn't sound like a good thing, but trust me, it works pretty well. Alas, this solution was not especially viable on console platforms. I played through the game on Nintendo Switch, but it is available on other platforms as well. The problem here is that the default method for playing a Construct 2 game simply wasn't fast enough to run on the Switch, so they had to come up with another solution. To solve it, the game was converted to the C language by Radalika Games, from what I can tell anyways, allowing it to run fast and smooth without issue. The key here is that even if you're playing on Switch, the frame rate remains locked at 60 frames per second without any performance hiccups to speak of. It's rock solid. I know, for a 2D pixel art game that may not seem like a huge accomplishment, but we've seen enough titles released over the years that do struggle to run well on Switch even with 2D pixel art, so it's important to point this out. Furthermore, input latency is not an issue here, the game is fast and responsive across every platform. But there is one caveat regarding the controls. Moonrider features two different types of aerial kicks, a vertical kick and another one at an angle. Problem is, if you're playing this game in portable mode on the Switch, I found it difficult to pull off these individual moves using the default Joy-Con. In fact, a Pro Controller was basically required to pull off these moves reliably. This is a game that demands a good D-pad. No matter which version you play, however, you'll be treated to the same excellent soundtrack. According to Danilo, composer Dominic Nienmark was inspired to create a soundscape resembling an early 90s mega CD game. In creating the compositions, he used period-appropriate Yamaha samples and synths in order to ensure it accomplishes this goal. The results, I think, are pretty good. Honestly, taken together, I walked away impressed and delighted with Moonrider. The pace of the action, the varied level design, and tight controls all combine with an exceptional presentation to create something that just feels wonderful to play. It's very clearly a passion project that taps directly into classic 90s action games, which means it may not suit everyone's tastes, but if you are a fan of these games, you need to play Moonrider. That's going to do it for this video though, I hope you enjoyed it, and... We'll see you next time.